Yeah, normally, I'm up here talking about biological control programs because so, Sarah does so much of that. But fortunately, I have two colleagues who've been able to do that. And my task is to talk about you know, what, are, what are the next generation technology options there are for us in terms of being able to manage widespread pests and weeds. So I'm going to try and go through in a fairly, in fairly quick, quick speed about eight or nine technologies and technological solutions that are becoming available to assist us in this uh, a continual task to, for an integrated approach for managing our pests and weeds. I'm going to cover some IC ICT technologies and how they're changing our lives. We all know they're changing our day-to-day -day lives, but they're also changing the options available for us for managing widespread pests and weeds. I'm going to talk about some uh, modern technological solutions for detection technologies so we can work out where things are, how they're moving around in order to be able to target them more effectively. And then finally I'm going to get on to what's perhaps some more controversial of the new technologies coming available to us, which are the gene technologies. Things like gene drives that have been, and CRISPR-Cas9 that I'm sure you'll have come across in the media as being new genetic approaches that effectively could become next generation biological control solutions for pest management, but have significant um, sensitivities around them that will need to be, and regulatory issues that will need to be addressed. So just starting with the uh, ICT technologies, I'm going to cover sort of the benefits you get from various airborne imaging te technologies, some of the, uh, the huge advancement, advancements that have been made just in the last four or five years around automated vehicles and their use for, for widespread uh, particularly weed management, but increasingly uh, insect pests too, and some sensor networks in, in terms of um, being able to detect pests uh, uh, before, um, so you can then treat them. So um, we've, all, we've all heard about, and, 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 if, and if some of us have even used um, UAVs as a way of, uh, of scanning the environment, but the, the, the kind of technologies you can attach to, to these in terms of uh, the imaging and the... And the um, uh, and the data you can collect through, um, through these technologies um, in terms of understanding the environment below you have become really staggering. And you can build up 3D complex images of uh, the environment over which you're flying. So, for example, if you wanted to pick up a, um, a, a rare uh, but uh, invasive uh, exotic weed in a natural forest, the, uh, the technology is there to be able to, for the, for the, for the, the um, automated vehicle, aerial vehicles to be able to identify within the, the complex canopy uh, individuals of your uh, the target weed and be able to map them for further treatment. They can also uh, do thermal imaging. So you can pick up um, uh, images of, for example, um, mice in a crop field to understand how mice densities are changing over time. So these kind of technologies really are changing uh, the way we can detect uh, our pests and weeds in complex landscapes so we can much more easily treat them. And the, the way these the things are moving so fast is that these kind of, of aerial imagery is, is, is going to become uh, uh, available through uh, sat satellite imagery, satellites imagery through uh, the new satellites being put up, the next generation satellites is becoming Money much more sophisticated. We don't need to necessarily to fly vehicles over the landscape. We can pick it up from satellite imagery. And the government's investing a lot of money to make sure that that kind of information becomes free to the Australian public and the Australian farming community to be able to make this ma management decisions based on it for their properties. So that's one area of, of, of revolution. The other is, is um, the, much, the increasing use of robotics in, in widespread pest and weed management. We, We've just had a discussion about digital agriculture um, and the use of uh, um, these robots to uh, be able to collect data at very fine scale and help management decisions. They're also incredibly useful tools for, for uh, remotely uh, detecting, mapping and treating uh, invasive weeds. These, this is a shot of prickly acacia in the, the uh, desert channels in western Queensland. And experiments are underway using uh, um, artificial intelligence-based uh, helicopters to map and detect them, and then ground-based robots to go in and treat them without the requirement for human intervention and the costly use of human time and vehicles. Uh, and I, uh, I, had, I had lunch with uh, Tristan Perez from QUT, which, and he showed me videos of the, kind of the capacity of this technology now in, in, in your average cropping system, uh, where they have developed 
robots that can move around uh, the, the, the crop fields, detecting, identifying and detecting weeds and treating them as they go. And have they've already demonstrated that it's five times more cost effective to use their system than a, than, a, than, a, than a standard broom spray. So this is technology that's developed in the last five years and we'll be, we'll be seeing on our farms in the very near future to change the way we tackle these, these perennial problems. There's also um, uh, other ways of, of understanding the environment and detecting and uh, understanding the spread of, of pest and weeds is, is the uh, increasing use of sensor networks. These are uh, networks of individual sensors. They may be in a network on the ground or they may be a series of, of transmitters attached to uh, moving animals um, or they may be embedded in livestock as a way of uh, picking up information on movement, on abundance, so they can pick up uh, uh, um, uh, audible, they can pick up uh, visual, they can pick up uh, physiological information around the organisms that they're attached to or the context they're in, so you can remotely and very easily understand uh, issues that uh, around pest density, where they occur, but also you can use these technologies in a similar manner to, to, in order to um, support things like livestock health or, in, in the case of one of these images, understanding uh, the, the healthy um, condition of our bee pollinator populations. These are kinds of op op options for us now that really will change the way we, we are able to understand and therefore respond to the pests that are out there. Next, moving on to uh, detection technologies, and here um, particularly focusing on biosensors and smart traps. SARO has been in uh, the process of developing, and this is a kind of uh, sensor network. It's a series of, uh, of uh, a network of smart traps that uh, uh, will be able to detect, uh, for example, uh, pest fruit flies in real time or in an automated way, link it up as a network, you can read it through your mobile phone and you can pick up instantaneous detections of the pest species you're interested in. It's been develop, de being developed as a commercial platform in CSIRO under the name RapidAIM and it's a fairly cheap uh, um, uh, um, trapping system but it plays on the unique visual cues and the behavioural cues of the, uh, the pest organism to ensure that you get a highly specific detection. And it provides um, uh, uh, a, a basis for turning a bio biosecurity problem into a biosecurity industry. You can have um, automated pest specific traffic trapping based on these visual and behavioural cues. The, uh, the, the, pr the technology, therefore, can pr provide a, s a basis for a service industry that can support the horticultural industries. It also uh, allows, allows industry and, uh, and growers to respond immediately when they get the te a detection of, uh, of one of their high-profile pests. And that allows them to protect their, their, their uh, crops from uh, uh, the pests and allow them to ensure that they have access into those markets that are so, so dependent on, uh, on, on being pest-free. Syro has also been developing CyberNose for some time. It's, uh, it's a way effectively of, 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 very, um, uh, of analyzing a gaseous uh, uh, vapors. They could be from fruit, they could be from, uh, um, they could be from uh, uh, um, samples of, in, in, a, of, uh, in the environment from a pest animal. And it's, allows, it's, be, it's a technology that's been developed to be able to detect highly specific volatiles at, at incredibly low densities. You collect the volatile, you can then analyze it, you, uh, you identify in the volatile that you're interested in uh, the, the, the key volatile biomarkers, you develop the sensor around those biomarkers, and then you, have, uh, you can then turn that in a field de deployable device. One of the areas where this is being considered, for example, is in, in detection of tramp ants. Can we pick up tramp ant, at tramp ant incursions or, or isolated tramp ant populations through detecting the, 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 the volatiles that they produce to, to produce um, an objective, non-invasive and non-destructive and field-deployable biosensor to speed up our capacity to respond to incursions or manage outbreaks? And they, uh, they, um, these, these biosensors do, do this by detecting these uh, highly uh, specific biomarkers. And finally, the gene technologies. And here I'm going to cover off on, on uh, 
RNAi, that's our, uh, RNAi interference, which is a, a, a CIRO uh, IP technology. I'm going to talk about Riddle, which is a, a new way of approaching uh, sterile insect technology for control of things like mosquitoes and fruit flies. And finally, I'm going to cover off on, on gene drive and some of the controversies around it. How does it work? So RNAi is, uh, is small RNAi molecules, which are effectively just like micro -RNA, RNAs that are floating around in biological cells all the time, and that, that are a normal part of physiological or metabolic development. And they provide the filter between the code on the genome and the, and the generation of the phenotype. And you can use RNAi to disrupt uh, the, this sequence. And, uh, um, and, and while they, they might be involved in, microRNAs might be involved in disease, disease immunity and infection, they uh, pro provide you a way of disrupting those processes. So you can pick a, a particular uh, gene code for uh, resistance to a herbicide or a pesticide. And with RNAi, RNAi you can knock it out and, and, and induce um, uh, virulent, uh, induce susceptibility to it. Or you can use it to knock out a particular gene. For example, you might want to knock out a, a, a fertility gene in a female fruit fly to, uh, to, to improve your chance of sterile, uh, uh, sterile insect development. And RNAi provides you one of those options to do it. You can use RNAi in two ways, one which is endogenously within plants, so the plants are, ge are genetically manipulated to express them, and, and uh, um, Monsanto has done a lot of work to see whether or not RNAi can be induced in crop plants to control against uh, particular pests, or more interestingly and more acceptably, you can also uh, develop it as an exogenous um, chemical uh, that you can spray or you can can, uh, can have consumed by an insect to change the, uh, the, 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 uh, um, the fitness or a particular characteristic of the pest you're trying to challenge. It's still under development in this area. It's still, there's still a lot of work going on on trying to apply RNAi to technology to, to widespread pest management. And one of the huge problems is, is uh, 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 how, it's, how you can trans transmit the RNAi to the target cells. But as a technology, it is very mature in other areas. So it's already been used in agricultural systems to, um, for a number of, uh, of, of different, different development of different traits in plants. And, uh, and, and we still think that it has a, a huge potential for, uh, as a gene technology for um, managing some of our key pests. What could it target? What could RNAi RNA target in terms of um, managing pests? Well, you could use it to, to reduce the capacity of, of disease vectors from transmitting disease. And it's already been demonstrated that this is achievable in the laboratory using mosquitoes. You can, you can down-regulate uh, uh, down pesticide resistance genes, and, and, and therefore you might be able to use RNAi to evergreen our existing uh, uh, portfolio of pesticides. You can use uh, RNAi to uh, increase disease susceptibility. Uh, taking out disease resistance, or you could use RNAi to, to suppress genes that are vital for fertilization or viable embry embryo development. All of these are options in using this kind of technology to control pests. Now, Riddle, um, Riddle is already being used in the field. Uh, for you know, those of you that have, um, have been following the Zika virus outbreak, uh, Riddle is the technology behind the Oxitec mosquito that was uh, released in uh, Florida to help uh, combat the outbreak of, uh, of the, Z the Zika uh, virus and the mosquito populations there. So it's a, it's a very new technology, but it's already being deployed in the field. And it's a modern take on the, on the, on the sterile insect technology. Um, so SIT systems require the mechanical sorting to release only sterile males. That's the way the process works. You have to, to somehow get rid of the females or, or accept that you're going to have to release some of the female males with the sterile males. But the Riddle gene technology creates a lethal trait in a, in a, in the, linked into the, the, the female lethality, lethality gene. And therefore, um, all factory females that are produced using this technology um, die before maturity. And therefore, you can, uh, you can get around to only releasing, female, uh, only releasing your sterile males. And then similarly, because the, uh, the, 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 the construct is carried by the sterile males, when they mate with wild-type females, then all the female progeny of those wild-type females also die before maturity. So it's a, a, 
a clear case of a gene technology which is now already out there and being used in specific systems. And finally, uh, with what time I have left, I'd really like to go into a little bit more detail around sort of ge the gene drive opportunities and their, their role in pest management. So what is gene drive? Well, gene drive is the idea of finding a bad gene and then driving it into the population, the genome of every pest individual out there in the landscape. Gene, gene drive, in theory, provides us with the opportunity to eradicate species and is certainly being considered in that context in things like removing mosquitoes, uh, in, uh, uh, eliminating mosquitoes on the Hawaiian Islands or eradicating mice from high conservation value islands. As an idea, gene drive was first thought of in 2002. In 2009, the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 as a mechanism for, for, for generating a gene drive was discovered. Therefore, in 2014, gene drive, the first gene drive was developed and became a, a, a GM reality. Uh, and, by, and now in 2016, we know we c that it's capable of what it's capable of, but in order to decide whether or not it's a valuable tool, we have to address is issues of public acceptability and ethic, questions around ethics and the regulations that will be required for its use. And there's a lot of international debate and a lot of work going on in Australia to try and address these issues. But as I pointed out, the, um, the construct in, in the blue mosquito at the top eventually ends up in each member of the population. So what is gene drive? Gene drive is, is a way of uh, ensuring that the construct you want, the genetic construct you want to apply in the genome, gets into every um, uh, chromosome that contains that construct. As you know, we have paired chromosomes, and normal heritability goes, the, chromoso the, 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 the chromosomes separate into their two halves. Half goes to, 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 um, into one gamete, and the other half goes into the other gamete. With CRISPR-Cas9, which is an, a bacterial immunity mechanism, really in bacteria to be able to repair a, a viral infection of bacteria, it can detect sequences, cut them at very precise points, and we can manipulate that, and you can use that to, ins to, to put in your genetic construct. And the beauty of uh, being uh, uh, from a bacterial system is that it doesn't care that there are pairs of chromosomes. It can detect the same point on both chromosomes and ensure your construct goes into cr both chromosomes. And then it we we works sy synchronously down both of the chromosomes and ensures that it ends up in all progeny in some form. So when you have a gene drive system, uh, for example, in this working in mosquitoes, you have the mating between your gene drive and your wild type, and you have three options of the outcome. It could be that, uh, that the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the gene drive system, the, the Cas9 system, only manages to um, uh, put in your construct onto one of the chromosomes, uh, and that's the middle line here, and therefore you only get... Um, uh, you only get one construct on one of the chromosomes, but in the right-hand hand, uh, angle, you, uh, on the right hand of the diagram, you also have homologous uh, uh, recombination where you can get both constructs into both chromosomes, and then you get a positive gene drive. And a lot of the science is going on about how, re how reliably can we achieve uh, the right-hand option in which we get it into every chromosome uh, uh, in the po population. So what it is, so gene drives have, have offered a huge opportunity, they've offered potential, but what are the requirements and constraints around uh, the, the, gene, the effectiveness of, of a gene drive as an approach for managing pests? Well, any released target with a gene drive construct is a GM, so we've got to recognise that. You require sexual reproduction in order to go, go through it, be a heritable trait. You need a pest that's reproducing sexually and ideally that it has a fast uh, re reproductive process. You're releasing your, your, uh, gene, co uh, your GM uh, uh, gene drive infected individual into the wild without controls, so that's very high risk. But you've got to make sure that what the, the bad gene, the gene that you want to introduce into the population, isn't going to dramatically reduce the fitness of the pest, otherwise it'll be very quickly, uh, uh, very, very quickly driven out of the population. So you've got to be very careful about which constructs you choose. You've got to uh, you've got to be ensure that the, the CRISPR, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, every time manages to find the right sequence and add the bad gene. You need to be able to ensure you've got a high probability of getting your gene construct into both chromosomes, um, and uh, that your um, the, that we have to also in, be, be, be sure that the the construct once it's into the organism isn't very quickly. There aren't mutations 
and, and, uh, um, and uh, um, immunity processes within the organism that can also um, drive out the bad gene from the system. And we also need to have safety mechanisms. If we're going to release something into the wild that can, can effectively uh, spread into every individual of the population, what safety mechanisms can we develop to ensure that we have some control and we have some public confidence that we can use this technology? And also that provides an opportunity potentially to commercialize the technology. What would you target with a gene drive type target mechanism? Well, you'd, you could again remove resistance to existing pesticides from your target, pop, say if you've got a, a wild radish population of weeds which is heavily uh, herbicide resistant, you could remove that resistance by tackling uh, the resistant genes. You can uh, develop a, a daughterless gene drive for pest, pest animals. We've been using daughterless technologies to try and control pest animals. We can now use it using a gene drive system which would be much more efficient than the Mendelian processes we've used in the past. You could remove self-compatibility in weeds. You could reduce the significant fitness of some of our dominant weeds by reducing their capacity to self-pollinate. You can induce uh, male or uh, uh, female sterility or male fertility, and you could even just in, um, redu increase the susceptibility of your target organism to some benign chemical. If we, we drove a, a gene into a mouse population that said that they were highly susceptible to, say, I don't know, methylated spirits, you could then use, once they were in the population, the population would be, would be uh, um, completely natural until the, the animals became exposed to whatever, whatever benign chemical you decided to use. So you can make a, a pest population much more susceptible to something that you might more benignly use in the environment. And then you can induce disease susceptibility in order to be able to more effectively control your pest with, say, a biopesticide. The options are, are many, uh, but the uh, concerns are also many, and the public support for this is, 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 a, is, a, is a tipping scale. There are a lot of, of, of arguments as to why we have to be very careful about gene drive. There was a proposed moratorium at the Convention on Biological Diversity for the use of gene drive, but it also provides us with many opportunities. So to finish, I'd just like to say that there are a huge number of technologies that are coming onto the market that can change the way we, we tackle pests, revolution, revolutionizing the options for pest management. But we need to develop them carefully and we need to, 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 uh, to, to uh, understand their farm gate benefits, their economic viability, and their public acceptability. So there are some huge challenges ahead, but we now have technologies that are available to us to really change the way we can deal with some of our widespread pests. Thank you.